Chapter 31 Brazil James got back to the room without Bill, Eugene or Curtis even noticing that he'd gone. He was almost certain Marvin would have listened to the cell phone message, but it played on James's mind as he lay in the dark room, with Lauren and Curtis asleep and Eugene's snores rumbling through the connecting door. James was half awake at 5.30am when Bill crept up to Curtis's bed and shook him awake. The teenager seemed to be suffering the after-effects of his attack on the minibar as he sat up in bed. I thought the flight was later, Curtis moaned, picking at a gluey eye. Keep it down, Bill whispered. I just made a scheduled call to your mother. She's nervous about this whole show. There's been another change of plan, and we don't want the two brats over there knowing about it. (sighs) Mom's whole life has been a change of plan, Curtis sighed. Can I say goodbye to James and Lauren? Let him sleep. You know how this works better than anyone. The less they know about when you got out of here and where you went, the better. James had a crick in his neck, but didn't dare move in case the old man realised he was awake. Curtis swung off his bed and dashed to the bathroom. After bolting the door, James heard him pee, followed by a retching sound as he spewed up in the toilet bowl. James stifled a laugh as Bill wandered over and rapped gently on the locked door. You okay in there, boy? There was an array of noises from the bathroom as Curtis cleaned himself up and gargled mouthwash. Oh, man, Curtis gasped as he exited. Must have been something I ate. I hope I'm not sick again on the plane. Something you drank, more like, Bill grumbled. I can smell it coming out your pores. Curtis stumbled meekly across the floor and started picking up his belongings. Forget that junk, Bill said. Put your pants and sneakers on, then we're shipping out. James raked his brain, wondering if he should follow Bill and Curtis. If Marvin hadn't gotten the message, or if they were expecting Curtis to be getting a later flight and were still in bed, they'd permanently lose the trail to Jane Oxford. On the other hand, James would blow his cover if he was caught sneaking around after them, Ready? Bill asked as Curtis wriggled his foot into his trainer and stood up. I guess, Curtis said uncertainly. He stepped across the room towards the other bed and looked at James. Have a nice life, buddy, he whispered softly. Curtis followed Bill through the connecting door and they exited via the other room. James sprang up as soon as the door clunked. He leaned in the next room to make sure Eugene was asleep before scrambling into tracksuit bottoms and trainers and grabbing a room entry card from the table beside his bed. He poked his head into the corridor as Bill and Curtis's backs disappeared around a corner, heading for the elevators. James raced down the back stairs, planning to catch up with them in the lobby. Unfortunately, there were no guest rooms on the ground floor. James found himself at the back of a conference suite staring at a blank grey fire door that only opened from the other side. Anxious not to lose Curtis for good, James broke open the fire door and found himself standing in the hotel car park. The sun was peeking over the horizon and his t-shirt did nothing to ward off the bitter wind sweeping across the open tarmac. James quickly glanced around, making sure there was nobody in sight, before jogging between the lanes of parked cars towards the hotel entrance. When he got close, he noticed a queue of people stepping onto a small bus with Star Plaza Airport Shuttle written down the side. Curtis and Bill were in the line. James ducked between two cars. He was desperate to go into the lobby and call the FBI team to make sure they knew what was going on, but he was pinned to the spot until the bus left. Finally, the last passenger boarded and the hydraulic door hissed shut. As the bus began rolling away, a man thumped desperately against the side. The driver hit the brake sharply to let on a final passenger. He was a huge black man, wearing a cowboy hat and a suit the colour of red wine. James smiled with relief. He needn't have worried. Marvin Teller had got the message. Lauren woke with a fright. She caught half a second's glance inside the old man's toothless mouth before her whole world turned black. Eugene smeared a pillow over her face and squeezed down so hard she could feel the mattress springs digging into the back of her head. 
Lauren arched her back and tried to wriggle free, but Eugene swung his knee across the bed and used it to pin down her thighs. There was no air in Lauren's lungs to scream. She tried to pull some in, but the pillow driving into her face made it impossible, like trying to suck wet concrete through a drinking straw. She knew the numbers from when she'd learned to scuba dive. Five minutes to suffocate, but only three for the lack of oxygen to cause permanent brain damage. Where was James? Lauren wondered if her brother was already dead, as she realised her right arm was free to move. She felt a glimmer of hope as she fumbled blindly over the top of the bedside cabinet, hunting for some kind of weapon. She recalled the biro with the Star Plaza logo on it as soon as she touched it. She gripped it tight and flipped off the lid with her thumb. It wasn't much, but it was all she had. Lauren's concentration drifted for a second, the first sign of losing consciousness. She bit her tongue to help focus her mind and blindly thrust with the pen. It hit Eugene in the shoulder, causing only mild discomfort and a blue trail down the sleeve of his shirt. Irritated by the prospect of having to wash out a stain, Eugene shifted his weight as he tried to grab the pen with his free hand. The pressure moved off Lauren's thighs as Eugene leaned forward. She used all her strength to thrust her knees up into the man's behind. Eugene's grip on the pillow loosened as he jerked upwards, enabling Lauren to twist her head to one side and haul in a lungful of air. Eugene immediately shifted his entire body weight back onto Lauren, inflicting extra pain by digging his kneecap into her belly. Lauren refused to let the excruciating pain deter her desperate escape attempt. She glanced a shaft of light between the sheet and pillow, then spotted one of Eugene's fingertips as he attempted to straighten her head and reposition the pillow over her face. Quite the little fighter, ain't you? Eugene said, clearly not regarding the ten-year-old's struggle as anything more than a minor setback. Lauren wriggled her head forward a few centimetres. When she felt the base of Eugene's fingernail pressing against her lips, she bit down hard. The knee slipped off her stomach as the bite sent the old man into a spasm. Temporarily abandoning his murder attempt to concentrate on his finger, Eugene snatched the pillow away. With the finger still clamped between her teeth, Lauren inhaled through her nose and, now she could see what she was doing, aimed the pointed end of the biro into the soft tissue at the side of Eugene's throat. The pen sounded like a sink plunger as the metal point speared his wrinkled flesh. Lauren let the finger out of her mouth as Eugene slumped across the bed, wailing in agony. Lauren pulled her legs from under him and knocked him cold with a two-footed karate kick to the side of the head. Shaking with fear and clutching her painful stomach, Lauren rolled off the bed and lifted the corner of the mattress to retrieve the Glock handgun she'd seen James stash there the night before. She flipped the safety off and quickly checked the bathroom and the floor beside the other bed terrified she was about to discover her brother's suffocated body. She held the gun two-handed as she crept into the connecting room, again checking between the beds. The bathroom gave Lauren a shock. Eugene had carefully set out knives and polythene sheeting to dispose of her body. Lauren was still no closer to knowing what had happened to James. Maybe Eugene had knocked him out while he was sleeping and dragged him off to be suffocated in another room. Or maybe he'd been invited downstairs for an early breakfast with Bill and Curtis. You might as well let Lauren sleep in if she's tired. Eugene will look after her. With Eugene unconscious and James's fate a mystery, Lauren knew she had no option but to call Marvin. As she picked up the receiver, she heard someone enter the next room. Realising she had surprise on her side, Lauren crept towards the connecting door, but managed to stub her bare toe on the leg of a table. Her tiny gasp was enough to send the figure in the next room diving into the shadows behind one of the beds before she'd got a proper look at him. I've got a gun! Lauren shouted as she leaned into the doorway, squeezing the trigger to fire a warning shot. Lauren didn't realise the Glock was capable of repeat fire, or that she'd inadvertently flipped it to automatic when she took off the safety. She felt like there was a high-pressure hose in her hands as the recoil from half a dozen bullets shoved her backwards. The shots plunged into the wall, smashed the mirrored front of a wardrobe and knocked clumps of plaster out of the ceiling. Lauren ended up sprawled backwards over one of the beds. A stunned shout came out through the dust clouds and broken glass in the next room. <coughs> it's me! James coughed 
as he stood up with his hands in the air. Where the hell did you disappear to without bothering to wake me up? I nearly got killed! James stepped through the dust and snatched the gun from his sister. Mental gun, eh? He said. It's what the SAS use. You're supposed to stand with one leg behind the other, so it doesn't push you backwards. So where's Curtis? On his way to the... Before James finished speaking, the locks in both room doors clicked simultaneously. James spun around, ready to spray more bullets. FBI! Warren shouted, aiming a gun into the room. All safe! All safe! James and Lauren shouted back frantically. John and Theo had rushed into the other room and ended up staring at James through the connecting door. We heard the gunfire. What happened? John asked. The unconscious guy with the biro sticking out of his neck just tried to smother me, Lauren explained matter-of-factly. That doesn't make sense, James said. What about the Canadian passports we saw last night? Look for yourself if you don't believe me, Lauren said, pointing indignantly towards the bathroom. I don't go around sticking people with biros for the fun of it, you know. James, John, Warren and Theo peeked at the equipment laid out in the bathroom. James felt queasy when he imagined what had nearly happened. Wasn't Jane Oxford supposed to be loyal to people who help her out? James asked bitterly. We clearly overestimated the extent of that loyalty, Theo said. But the passports are a classic Jane Oxford ruse. She always makes three or four different plans and only tells people which one she's going to use at the very last minute. It's possible that Bill was given the passports and believes that you two were going to be sent to Canada while Eugene was under instructions to kill you. It's a clever tactic, Warren added. We've had it a few times where we've broken down one of Oxford's operations and made arrests, only to find that there is a mass of evidence pointing in different directions. When it gets to court, the defense lawyers use the contradictions to pull you apart. If Jane Oxford intended to kill James and Lauren Rose, why did she spend $10,000 buying them false identities, booking airline tickets, and arranging for them to stay with Mr. and Mrs. Ladi Dar in Toronto, and so on? But why would she try to kill us? Lauren asked. We never did anything to hurt her. I suppose she thought you might have talked if you were ever recaptured, Theo said. You knew about Etienne and the Little family. She clearly wanted you dead the second Curtis wasn't around to see it happen. Heartless bitch, James said, shaking his head. We helped her own son escape, and her only thanks was to try and kill us. It figures, though, Warren said. Oxford hasn't evaded the law for 20 years by being sentimental. We can speculate all we like once this is over, John said tersely. Right now, I suggest we put our heads together and concentrate on working out where we go from here. I think we'd better call an ambulance for Eugene first, Theo said. Things are starting to look a little gooey over there. Apart from that, all we can do is make sure we don't lose track of Curtis, Warren said. We've got agents on standby at Dallas Airport and in Brazil. Hopefully Jane will show her face wherever Curtis ends up. Trouble is, she'll run a mile if she finds out that everything here just went pear-shaped. Theo's cell phone rang. He grabbed it out of his jacket and had a brief conversation with Marvin. Oh, you're not going to believe this, Theo groaned. Bill got a phone call while he was on the airport bus. When they arrived, Marvin got off and hung back to follow Bill and Curtis, but Bill told the bus driver he'd left something back at the hotel and they're staying on for the ride back. Is Marvin still with them? John asked. Theo shook his head. It would have been too suspicious if he'd reboarded the bus. Curtis and Bill should be back at reception any minute now. Chapter 32 Motel The shuttle bus only took 15 minutes to ride between the hotel and the airport. So here's what happened, John said, thinking as he spoke. Eugene tried to kill James and Lauren, but got his comeuppance. Once they realised Jane Oxford wanted them dead... James and Lauren grabbed the money and valuables and left the hotel in a big hurry. Warren pointed at Eugene, who was still unconscious on the bed. What about him? He needs an ambulance. John shrugged. He was about to kill the kids, so forgive me if I haven't got a lot of sympathy for him. Theo leaned over the bed and inspected Eugene's injury. 
It's behind the windpipe and he's not losing much blood. With the biro still bunging up the hole, I believe he'll be good for a few hours at least. Okay, let's grab the valuables and clear out of here sharpish, John said. Theo pocketed Eugene's wallet while Lauren grabbed the briefcase with the money and passports. They were almost out of the door when the phone rang. John made a split-second decision. James, you answer that. Hello? James said as he frantically grasped the receiver and stumbled onto the bed. Eugene, is that you? Bill asked. It's James. Oh, Bill said, sounding exceptionally surprised. I didn't expect you to still be around. Is Eugene there? Now, he's been locked in the toilet for ages, James said, trying to sound cool. I don't know what he's playing around at in there. John gave James a smile and a thumbs up for his quick thinking. Bill sounded angry. You tell Eugene to get his sorry old ass moving. Tell him I've checked Curtis in for his flight, but I'm on my way back here to find a certain car, and I'll meet him at the motor lodge this evening. Okay, I'll pass that on, James said. Thanks very much for helping us out, by the way. Bill sounded stunned. Uh, that's okay, James. It was a pleasure. The call went dead. What did he say? John asked. Something about being on his way to find a car, but he said he dropped Curtis off at the airport. John shrugged. I guess he said that for your benefit. It's classic Jane Oxford, again, Theo said. She has Bill set up with a passport and an airline ticket, then she pulls the plan at the last minute and sends him off on a car journey. But why wait until he gets to the airport, then send him back here? Lauren asked. Wouldn't it have been better to send him to pick up the car somewhere else? I guess Bill was running early, Theo said. Jane probably thought he was still here. Judging by that phone call, Bill and Curtis won't be coming back to this room, which makes our lives easier, John said. We've got to get downstairs and make sure we don't lose them when they get off the airport shuttle and try to find this car. Someone will have to stay here and deal with Eugene, Theo said. We can't leave him for the poor me to find. Okay, Theo, John said. You stay here and deal with that, but don't call for an ambulance until after you see us leave. Warren and I will go down to the car park, see what car Bill and Curtis get into, and chase after them. What about me and Lauren? James asked. John thought for a second before digging out his car keys. You can navigate and operate the radios. It's a black Chrysler parked in row F. Get in, start the engine so that the car's ready to pull away as soon as I get there, then belt yourself into the passenger seat. Warren dangled his keys in front of Lauren. Blue Volvo, park next to John's. Make sure you keep down if you see Bill or Curtis. James and Lauren raced five floors down the back stairs, out through the fire doors and into the car park. They found row F and were climbing into the cars as the airport shuttle stopped in front of the lobby. A rumble of static burst out of the police radio in the dashboard as James started the engine and climbed over to the passenger seat. Curtis and Bill both disappeared inside the lobby. James looked across at Lauren in the next car and shrugged, hoping that they weren't changing plans again. Warren's voice erupted from the loudspeaker. I'm in the lobby and I think we're okay. They've both gone into the bathroom. Curtis looks a little green around the gills. James spotted them emerging through the revolving doors a couple of minutes later. Both kids dropped down in their seats so they were out of sight as Bill led the way out into the row of cars. He stopped when he reached a shabby yellow Nissan that looked like a retired taxi. He stepped back to read the registration plate, then fumbled around under the front wheel arch until he located an ignition key. James was feeling tense. He jumped out of his skin as John opened the driver's door beside him. Look in the glove box, John said as he slammed the door and pulled his seatbelt across his chest. Get the best map you can find. Try to keep track of where we are and remember the names of shops and landmarks as you pass them. In any pursuit, you must be able to accurately relay your position to other cars. James nodded as he rummaged through the glove box for a map. As John pulled away, he passed Warren walking briskly towards the other car. Theo's voice broke out over the radio. I'm looking out of the hotel window. I see a yellow Nissan pulling right. Over. John pointed at the microphone. You work the radio, James. James picked up the plastic microphone and looked unsure what to say. 
Just tell them we're on it, John said. By the time Marvin had sprinted across Boy's airport to the taxi rank and arrived back at the Star Plaza, an ambulance crew was on the scene to deal with Eugene. Marvin hurled money at the cab driver and rushed off without getting change. As he pulled his car out of its spot, Marvin asked for a fix on Bill and Curtis over the radio. This is Car F. We're eight miles ahead, on Route 16, heading southwest, James replied. Bill clearly didn't want to risk getting pulled over for speeding and kept the yellow Nissan dead on the limit, enabling Marvin to catch up with John and Warren. Marvin and Warren had been trained in pursuit driving on the opposite side of the Atlantic to John, but the basic technique is the same wherever you learn. The lead car kept the yellow Nissan in sight. The second car held back between a quarter and a half a mile, ready to continue the chase if the suspect made a sudden manoeuvre and fooled the driver of the first car. The third car followed another mile behind that. To minimise suspicion, the cars switched positions every 15 to 20 minutes. An hour and a half after leaving Boys, they'd passed into the state of Oregon and were travelling northwest on a busy section of interstate towards Baker City. Lauren's voice broke across the radio from the lead car. James was dead impressed by how professional she sounded. Yellow Nissan is off at Rouge Court Motor Inn. That's Rouge Court Motor Inn. We have passed the exit, but can come around if needed. Negative, Marvin answered. Pull up somewhere a few miles ahead and keep the engine running. We might need you later. I'm going to pull in after them. John, I need backup. I want you to pull up short and try to cover me from the side. A mile and a half sounds a long way to hang back, but at 70 miles an hour, it only took John a minute to reach the Rouge Court. The motel formed part of a strip, along with a burger joint, diner and gas station. John rolled up in front of the diner. They jumped out of the car and crouched behind some bushes overlooking the Rouge Court parking lot. James had nothing but a t-shirt covering his top half, so he tucked his hands under his armpits to ward off the cold. Have you still got the Glock? John asked. James nodded as he pulled it from the elastic of his tracksuit pants. John swapped it for his revolver. I might need the extra firepower. Bill stood in front of a locked glass door, ringing a buzzer to try and get into the motel reception. Marvin couldn't get out of his car, in case Bill recognised him from the airport shuttle ride. Curtis sat in the front seat of the yellow Nissan, with his elbow resting on the ledge of the open window. James heard the door of one of the motel rooms clunk shut. The woman who emerged was dressed in a pink t-shirt with big glasses and a towel around her hair, like she just washed it. Her mules scraped along the damp pavement with every step she took. She was almost level with the yellow Nissan when James recognised the glasses from the photograph he'd seen in the visitor's room at Arizona Max. It's her, James whispered, nudging John excitedly. Jane Oxford. I don't think so, John said, shaking his head. By the time John had finished denying it, Curtis had jumped out of the car and wrapped his arms around her. Holy cow, John stuttered, grabbing his walkie-talkie out of his jacket. Warren, Marvin, I'm eyeballing Jane Oxford right now. Get over here. A shout came at James and John from behind. Hey, what are you hiding down there for? It was the cook from the diner, a greasy man dressed in an even greasier apron. Curtis and Jane both turned towards the shout. It left John with no option but to move immediately. Cover the door of her motel room, John said urgently. She might have backup in there. James clicked the safety off the revolver. John leapt out of the bushes and fired a shot into the back of the yellow Nissan to make it clear he meant business. FBI! Freeze! John closed Jane and Curtis down, looking nervously from side to side, with the gun held in a two-handed grip. Marvin and Bill both heard. Bill pulled his gun from its holster and headed around the corner to Jane's rescue, not realising that an FBI agent was emerging from a car behind him. Marvin had never struck James as the kind of man who stood any nonsense, and he proved it by pulling his gun and shooting Bill twice in the back, without even bothering to shout a warning. Marvin snatched Bill's gun as he stepped over the bleeding man and rounded the corner to the yellow Nissan. This is turning into a real good morning's work, Marvin grinned, unhooking the set of handcuffs on his belt as he closed in on Jane. 
James kept one nervous eye on the door of Jane's motel room and the other on Curtis, trying to read his face. No sane person would make a run for it with two guns pointing at them from close range, but that didn't take into account Curtis's suicidal tendencies. While John covered him with a Glock, Marvin made Jane Oxford take her hands off her head and fixed a set of cuffs over her wrists. Look at that, Marvin said smugly as he squeezed them on. Perfect fit. Jane lashed her head around and spat down the lapel of Marvin's suit. Marvin furiously lifted Jane into the air and thumped her down on the hood of the Nissan. While pinning Jane with one hand, he unhooked a can of pepper spray from his belt and held it in her face. Don't make me use this, Marvin said firmly. Angered by what was happening to his mother, Curtis made a sudden lunge towards John. James's heart jumped, knowing John only had to pull on the trigger to tear Curtis apart. But John had no intention of using a gun on an unarmed 14-year-old. Instead, he wrapped an arm around Curtis's waist and bundled him backwards onto the damp tarmac. The boy thrashed around, letting out a giant moan as John zipped a set of disposable plastic cuffs over his wrists. By the time Warren rolled onto the forecourt, Jane and Curtis were cuffed up in the back of Marvin's car. While Warren leaned over Bill and used his cell phone to call an ambulance, James crept around the bushes and climbed in the back of the Volvo behind his sister. Lauren glanced over her shoulder. It looks like Jane's crying. Good, James said sourly. She wanted us dead. I hope she burns in hell. I feel sorry for Curtis, though. Poor sod's not all there, is he? James said. Those drawings he ripped up were fantastic. Lauren clambered over the armrest between the two front seats and crashed next to James in the back. She rested her head against James's shoulder as he put an arm around her back. After all James and Lauren had been through, the scene they overlooked was an anti-climax. A quiet car park, three cops, two suspects cuffed in the back of a car, and a man lying unconscious on the ground. When the manager of the motel emerged from reception, he had the resigned look of someone who'd seen it all before. Are you okay? James asked, pulling his rather sad-looking sister a little tighter. My tummy still hurts, from earlier, Lauren said. It's all a bit of a letdown, really. James looked confused. We caught Jane Oxford. What more do you want? I don't know. I guess I was expecting a big shootout, or something. Fancied some blood and guts, eh? James smiled. Helicopters chasing us down the road, firing machine guns, and cigar-chomping mercenaries with strings of ammo around their necks. Yeah, <laughs> Lauren giggled. And it all ends up at Jane Oxford's mountain lair, where we find the stolen weapons and blow them all up, diving out of the way seconds before a ball of flame erupts from the mouth of a cave. James nodded. And I get to rescue a whole bunch of hottie cheerleaders who Jane was holding hostage. The two best-looking ones give me their cell phone numbers. Trust you, Lauren tutted. Of course, my hair would remain perfect throughout. <sighs> if only we lived in the movies, James sighed, straightening up his grin. Seriously though, the only thing that matters is that we captured Jane without any good guys getting hurt. Lauren nodded. Do you think they'll find the missiles, now they've caught her? Hopefully, James shrugged. We've done our bit. I'm just looking forward to going home and chilling out. Kerry should be back by now. Will you tell her about Becky? Not if I can help it. You know what her temper's like. She'd break my legs. Oh, Lauren said. James sounded anxious. Y you're not going to spoil everything by grassing on me, are you? I suppose not, Lauren sighed, seeing as you're my brother. But I still think you're a dirtbag. You don't deserve someone as nice as Kerry for a girlfriend. Chapter 33 Campus After 20 hours of cars, aeroplanes, airport terminals, a train into town, and a minibus ride to campus, James was a wreck. His joints ached, like every drop of liquid had been sucked out of his body and replaced with chewing gum, and he was so desperate for sleep, his eyes felt like lead balls. Lauren made the journey worse. 
She pulled off her usual trick of sleeping effortlessly, while James twisted in his economy class seat, suffering through two dreadful romantic comedies. It was past noon when they arrived back at campus. James ignored Lauren's exuberant pleas to help her unpack the boxes that had been piled up in her new quarters for nearly a month. He went to his room, stripped to his boxes, buried himself under his duvet, and fell asleep inside two minutes. James woke four hours later with muddy fingertips sweeping across his cheek. I thought I'd better wake you up, Kerry said softly as she sat down on the edge of James's bed. If you sleep for too long now, you won't be tired tonight and you'll still be jet lagged tomorrow. James yawned as he sat up in his bed. <sighs> what time is it? Quarter to five. I just finished football practice. James rubbed his eyes and couldn't help smiling as he took his first proper look at his girlfriend in three months. Kerry had done some growing up, and even with shin pads and streaks of mud on her legs, James thought she looked beautiful. He leaned forward and they exchanged a long kiss. I smell all sweaty, Kerry said when she eventually pushed James away. I don't care, James said, moving in for another kiss. I like your smell. Well, I don't much like yours, Kerry said, with a tiny hint of sharpness. You smell like that horrible air freshener they spray on aeroplanes. Do I? James asked, raising his arm and sniffing his pit. Ooh, that's pretty nasty, actually. You're a class act, James, Kerry grinned as she stood up. Oh, you didn't notice, she added, pulling her t-shirt down over her football shorts. James stared at Kerry's breasts bulging out of the t-shirt. Of course I noticed. They're miles bigger than they were before. Kerry stepped forward and whacked him across the shoulder. God, is that all you boys ever think about? James grinned guiltily. Pretty much. What about my t-shirt? Kerry said indignantly. The colour of my t-shirt. Oh, James gasped. You got the navy t-shirt. Congratulations! Thank you, Kerry grinned sweetly as she headed for the door. I'm going to have a shower, then I'll see you downstairs for dinner. The dining hall was packed when James got downstairs. He passed Lauren and Bethany, who were sitting amongst a group of the youngest grey shirt kids, making a racket. James queued up and picked spaghetti bolognese, salad and chocolate trifle before heading across the tables where his friends always sat. Gabrielle and Kerry were the only ones there. James sat opposite them. Where is everyone? Callum, Connor and Shaquille are still away on their recruitment missions, Gabrielle explained. Bruce is on a mission in Norfolk and Kyle's over at the back of campus, up to his waist in slurry. And I've got a bone to pick with you, Kerry said, folding her arms seriously. James grinned as he crammed in a forkload of spaghetti. Oh, that does make a change. I hear you've been cheating on me while I was away. James inhaled 200 strands of spaghetti as he gasped. He couldn't believe that this had happened after Lauren had promised not to tell. <coughs> Listen, James coughed. Whatever she told you, it's not true. Kerry shook her head slowly as James hacked chewed up pasta into a serviette. Don't lie to me, James. Bruce and half a dozen other guys saw everything that happened. Now James was seriously confused. Bruce? I'm okay with it, Kerry said. You know, if you ever feel that you want to explore your gay side. My what? James gasped, shaking his head. What do you want about? <laughs> Look, Kerry giggled. I just wanted you to know that if you ever feel the urge to snog Kyle again, I won't be holding any grudges. James felt like a five billion ton weight had lifted off his chest as the pieces fitted together. This had nothing to do with Becky. Kerry was winding him up about the time he'd kissed Kyle as a joke after fitness training. Ah oh, yeah, me and Kyle, James groaned as he desperately tried to recap everything he'd said to make sure he hadn't accidentally given the game away. He realised the pastor had probably saved him. He dreaded to think what he might have blurted if he hadn't been choking. 
Real funny. Did I hear you say Kyle's on punishment cleaning out ditches again? Gabriel nodded. That boy is so dumb. Why? James grinned. What's he done this time? You remember the little DVD production line he was running? James nodded, his mouth too full to speak. I think the staff were prepared to turn a blind eye while he was running off the odd movie for his mates, Gabriel explained. But he started getting greedy. How come? James asked. Kyle started getting more orders than he could handle by himself. So he employed Jake Parker to help burn the DVDs and put the labels on. James nodded. I know Jake. He's Bethany's little brother. Jake thought it would be funny to mix up the labels. James broke into a smile. That's not good. No, it wasn't, Gabriel said. Especially not when a bunch of six-year-olds ended up at a sleepover with a copy of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre instead of Harry Potter. <laughs> Classic, James yelled, banging on the tabletop and howling with laughter. Kerry kicked him under the table. It's not funny, James. One poor kid peed her nighty. <laughs> I guess it's not really funny, <laughs> James said, before erupting into a fresh round of hysterics. Kerry was struggling to keep a straight face herself. She leaned across the table and stared into James's eyes. He wiped the bolognese from his mouth and kissed Kerry on the lips. It was good to have her back. Epilogue Jane Oxford did not cooperate with the FBI. She refused to answer any questions except to acknowledge her name. She faces charges for murder, racketeering and weapon smuggling and can expect to spend the rest of her life in prison. The complexity of the charges against her mean that a trial is unlikely to take place for several years. In the meantime, she remains on remand at the Federal Supermax Prison in Florence, Colorado. After Jane's arrest, the FBI used information in her possession at the time to uncover homes and assets she controlled around the world. As more secrets were unveiled, it became clear that Jane Oxford had changed the focus of her operations from stealing weapons to stealing the technology underlying them. She then used front companies such as Eddie N Defense Consultancy to sell this knowledge on to other weapons manufacturers. With the global armaments industry turning over half a trillion dollars a year, Jane found this business far more lucrative than selling arms to terrorist groups and poverty-stricken third world governments. The FBI has already uncovered assets belonging to Jane Oxford worth more than $1.4 billion. Not only is this figure well in excess of what the FBI had expected to find, it is more than Jane's relatively modest lifestyle would ever have required. It seems that, true to her psychological profile, Jane Oxford carried on her criminal activities purely for the thrill of it. So far, no specific information has been found about the PGSLM buddy missiles. The FBI now suspect the missiles were stolen to order on behalf of a rival weapons manufacturer. However, until concrete evidence is found, there is no way to be certain of this. The possibility remains that the weapons have fallen into the hands of terrorists, or even that Jane Oxford did not steal them at all. Curtis Oxford was reclassified as an escape risk and returned to a single cell inside Arizona Max after 48 hours in the hole. A few months later, Curtis's Las Vegas-based uncles discovered that the psychiatrist who recommended he be sent to the Arizona-based military school was being investigated for accepting money in return for recommending his patients to the school. They instructed a lawyer to appeal Curtis's case on the grounds that the murders he committed were a result of the inappropriate advice given by the corrupt psychiatrist. On appeal, the judge accepted the arguments of Curtis's lawyers stating that Curtis Oxford has a long history of mental health problems. While Curtis must clearly still accept some responsibility for these very grave actions, this new evidence shows that it was inappropriate to try and sentence him as an adult. Curtis's original convictions for first-degree murder were quashed. Charges relating to the death of Scott Warren and the subsequent escape were also dropped. Three weeks later, Curtis pleaded guilty to four counts of the lesser charge of manslaughter in an Arizona youth court. 
Following a detailed psychiatric evaluation, he received a sentence of seven years to be served in a medium security young offenders institution. The families of the three people Curtis shot appeared on a local TV station saying that they were appalled by this decision. It has also emerged that Jane Oxford had set up a trust fund for her son, thought to be worth more than $30 million. This money has been thoroughly laundered through the international banking system and FBI sources believe it will be impossible to prove that it is the proceeds of criminal activity. When he is released from prison in 2012, Curtis Oxford will be an extremely wealthy young man. Among the other prisoners, Elwood and Kirch both turned 18 and were moved into the adult section of Arizona Max shortly after the escape. The brothers Stanley and Raymond Duff fully recovered from their injuries and returned to cell T4 once the riot damage had been repaired. The Arizona Department of Prisons has a long-standing policy of naming cell blocks after officers who died in the line of duty. The Scott Warren Memorial cell block is due to open soon in a new prison complex east of Phoenix. The inquiry into the escape made several recommendations for tightening up security inside Arizona Max. These included replacing the oversensitive doors and issuing all correctional officers with personal attack alarms that activate automatically when an officer is knocked down. A lack of money means these recommendations are unlikely to be implemented. Warren Reese, aka Scott Warren, quit his job as an FBI special agent so that he could spend more time with his wife and three young children. Theodore Monroe and Marvin Teller remain on the FBI team investigating the legacy of Jane Oxford's criminal activities. Paula Partridge was questioned by police in California and Arizona. They saw no reason to doubt her story about being held hostage. She later received an undisclosed compensation payment from the Arizona Department of Prisons and $7,000 from a news agency for an interview about her terrifying ordeal at the hands of ruthless teenage killers. The article appeared in more than 100 newspapers and magazines across the United States and around the world. The money enabled Paula to move out of the trailer park and make the down payment on a small house. She also took her daughter, Holly Partridge, for an overnight stay at Disneyland. Vaughn Little's ranch was searched by the FBI and a significant cache of illegal weapons was found. These included Glock machine pistols, mortar rounds and sniper rifles. Vaughan and his wife Lisa Little were charged with harbouring a fugitive and possession of unlicensed firearms with intent to sell. Vaughan was sentenced to eight years in prison, while Lisa received a term of four years. The ranch and Arabian horses had to be sold to pay legal costs, and Rebecca Little, aka Becky, moved to live with her eldest sister in California. Eugene Driscoll recovered fully after the biro was removed from his neck. William Bentley, a.k.a. Bill, similarly recovered from the gunshot wounds inflicted by Marvin Teller. Police checks indicated that the two men had been working together as contract killers for more than 40 years. They were wanted for 30 murders in 11 US states and two Canadian provinces. After the two men had recovered, the FBI transported them to Texas. Following a three-week trial, they were found guilty of six counts of murder and sentenced to death by lethal injection. The lengthy appeals process means it will be several years before their death sentences are carried out. Dave Moss was quietly removed from his guarded room in the Arizona hospital and arrived back at Cherub campus a few days after James and Lauren. He resumed light physical training shortly after returning and was declared fully fit two months later when ultrasound scans showed that the blood clot on his chest had dissolved. A detailed report is written on every chair admission. The report on the prison break congratulated all participants for the overall success of the mission. However, James Adams was severely criticised for his reckless crashing of the Toyota, and Dave Moss for falling asleep and almost allowing James to be stabbed by Stanley Duff. Only Lauren Adams escaped without rebuke. The report described her as courageous, clear-thinking, cooperative, and as a young agent with massive future potential. After reading the report, Dr. McAfee decided that her role in the mission justified giving her the Navy t-shirt, making her one of the youngest ever to wear it. 
While the staff at Cherub had some reservations about the performance of their young agents, over in America, the CIA and FBI were delighted with the capture of Jane Oxford. Four weeks after James returned to campus, Dr. McAfee received a package from CIA headquarters. It contained three boxes made of highly polished piano wood, one each for James, Dave and Lauren. James wondered what was in the box when he came up to his room after lessons and spotted it resting on his pillow. He pulled open the tightly sprung hinge and stared at the gold disc with the head of an American eagle at the centre of a five-pointed star. The Intelligence Star is a medal awarded by the United States for a voluntary act or acts of courage performed under hazardous conditions or for outstanding achievements or services rendered with distinction under conditions of grave risk. James couldn't help grinning as he turned the medal over and read his name engraved on the back.